For the helper T cells, there's lots of subclasses of T helper T cells that function based off of the various infections or whatever type of need we have at the time. And what determines the differentiation of these is obviously cytokines, but these are cytokines that come from the innate immune system. That's where we get the cytokines that are going to induce their differentiation. Um, this is because, you know, this, the helper T cells are so crucial and so important to the immune system being able to work and to be able to function as a whole. They have to be really flexible to adapt to the various types of infections that we can get, right? So all of these differentiation types here, Th1, Th17, Th2, whatever, these are all reversible differentiation. These are not like a permanent commitment things that they become like this guy's not going to be a Th1 cell for the rest of his life. And uh, what's interesting to me is, you know, We've studied these things in cultures, and we've studied them like as isolated instances. But inside your body, there's it's it's quite possible that you could need um, help from Th1 cells from say activating macrophages for intracellular infections, or say Th17 cells to enhance a. Uh, extracellular infections. So I, I'm wondering if we actually, what it would happen if we induced both of them at the same time with the same type of cytokines. Would you have basically a mixture of the two or would it be one? But anyways, right now, this is what we know. And um, my PI has added some extra little notes here and there about the cytokines that are actually involved in inducing the differentiation and then their effector function cytokines. Uh, I'm not qualified to say whether or not I think he's right or wrong. He just added all this extra stuff in here. And, you know, what's interesting to me is that this is, we're, we're really getting to the point in immunology where if you look in your textbook, you're going to start to see the words may being used. It may do this. It may be involved in this mechanism or this type of a pathway. We don't really, really know. Anyways, though, for Th1 cells, their primary uh, role is to be involved in activating macrophages. This is usually for intracellular infections for Th17. We're usually talking about extracellular. Um, for Th2, mostly involved with orchestrating an attack on parasites. How do we kill parasites? Well, we kill them with inflammation or we kill them with uh, getting them to shuffle them out of the body through very unpleasant <laughs> means for us. Uh, T follicular T cells, um, these guys are involved in activating B cells and helping with antibody response, isotype switching, things like that. And then the regulatory T cells, the induced kind, uh, these are involved in suppressing uh, all the other cell functions to kind of shut off the inflammatory response to shut off the immune system and allow for some promotion of healing and, and tissue repair. And like I had said earlier, uh, the, I think we had actually used this slide in the other uh, in the other videos that I've talked about. Um, because it's reversible, it's it's usually through a signal transduction pathway that involves a soluble. Uh, protein cytokine. We're not going to see any like, you know, steroid based hormones being involved in, in this uh, because of the short action that it has to have. So it binds, it activates this, and then once it dissociates away, it, it's, it's not going to stay in that state forever, right? It needs a continuous supply of cytokines to remain in the state. And that's how we know that we are still fighting an infection and that we need help. Um, so if, like I've already previously mentioned, Th1 is involved with intracellular infections, Th2 parasites, T follicular were involved in and, um, isotype switching, uh, increasing the antibody affinity, basically just helping B cells um, kind of speed up that process there. Th17, we're dealing with extracellular infections, and then for regulatory, we're going to be suppressing uh, all the other T cell populations. This is just a diagram. Um, it, I, I like it because it shows, one, the fact that we really, sorry, <laughs> don't know too much about all the other things that come into play with this, but usually the interleukins or cytokines or things like that that we're getting that induce differentiation to Th1, Th17, whatever, is from the innate immune system. And that's something that I think is interesting that it's they're working in tandem. The, <laughs> the helper T cells go and they tell the innate immune system how to work and the innate immune system says that they need help and that's what tells the type of helper T cells to come in there so it's really nice that they're working in tandem like that. Um, this is just a diagram here showing here we have Th1 cell. Um, the specific types of uh, cytokines that are involved in that I'll talk about that in my map but I just wanted to show that it's not just um, macrophages that they act upon right they're going to have inducing a lot of interferon in this context interferon gamma having a huge role to play in this and usually what you'll kind of I guess 
take note of is the fact that it's a soluble cytokine and then a receptor bound, so an insoluble type of a cytokine if you would want to think about it that way. These guys are central to macrophage activation uh, and macrophage activation is really, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things that they do, but this is the first thing that we discovered, one, and two, this is one of the mechanisms that we really understand well as opposed to others. So that's probably why you're seeing this talked about in your book as opposed to other stuff. It mentions it, but it doesn't really go in much detail about it. For macrophage activation, we need two signals. The first signal is from the interferon gamma, okay, a soluble cytokine, right? This is what we're seeing here. And then the second signal is from the CD40 ligand, which is going to make the macrophage responsive, or at least increase the response to it, to interferon gamma that's ultimately kind of becomes this logarithmic thing. But we need this pairing here is really a common trend. You'll see like a, a membrane-bound ligand and then, I mean, a membrane-bound uh, cytokine in this context, a CD40 ligand, and then a soluble one. Just to make sure that we have some like control, I guess, of, of, of location and areas of that. Anyways, so the cells that may make the effector molecules on demand which can sometimes take hours, right? And the reason that we do this is because depending on the type of infection that we have to deal with, we have to be flexible and we have to be um, you know, able to adapt to certain circumstances. He, this Th1 cell could be fighting some type of a pathogen right now and then have to you know, induce and change himself to CH2 to, to fight another one. So that, that flexibility is really important. One of the things that <laughs> blows my mind, this says that it takes hours. Sometimes it can even take as long as days, depending on the certain context. One of the things that I talked about earlier was the fact that when you start getting into the immune system, <laughs> and especially with macrophages and neutrophils, anything that's really powerful phagocytizing agent, those guys are really kind of harmful even to healthy tissue because the way that they work is by oxidation and, and by releasing radicals, which inflammatory diseases actually are one of the very directly at least correlated with cancers and, and other things that are kind of bad for the cell so we need to be sure that when we do this when it's, it's kind of like setting off a bomb that if we're going to drop this bomb we're going to be sure that it's controlled and that it's needed and that it's warranted and as you can imagine if we don't have the cd40 ligand we're less responsive to the interferon gamma then they're not they're going to be the macrophages are going to be turned off and here's a diagram that really just shows all the things that uh, the th1 cells do notice that it's a common pattern for membrane associated associated cytokines and secreted cytokines to work synergistically within a local area. And so for just this is just the TH1 cells, right? So interferon and CD40 ligand, this is involved in activating macrophages to destroy the engulfed bacteria, so intracellular type infections. We have the FAST ligand, hopefully that looks a little bit familiar to you. We're using it in a different context, uh, kind of in this kind of way, but also very similar to with what we saw with the uh, cytotoxic T cells. And tumor necrosis factor beta, which it's they're all the same family, right? And this is going to be killing chronically infected macrophages to release bacteria that are going to be destroyed by other healthy macrophages nearby. Interleukin-2, you know what that does. That's literally the nickname is the T-cell growth factor. This mechanism here, we didn't really talk about it. Uh, I, I don't recall ever mentioning that to you guys, but it induces macrophage differentiation in the bone marrow. Uh, also, obviously, secreting tumor necrosis factor alpha and beta, which is involved in diapedesis. Talked about that previously when we talked about the innate immune system, and then also to secrete CXCL2, which is anytime you see CXCL, think ligand. It's some type of a chemokine that's going to help recruit macrophages to the site of the infection. So macrophages are actually really, really good at their jobs. But the problem is that there are some cells and in every mechanism that we've talked about for the immune system, there's some type of other mechanisms that microbes have developed to counter that. And so some of them can actually resist uh, being phagocytized by an activated macrophage, right? And so a chronic infection is going to ensure resulting in the formation of a granuloma. And what a granuloma has a central area of infected macrophages surrounded by activated T cells. And they're, they're really large, actually. And they form the epithelium-like layer around the center here. And that's what we see here. So this is um, for example, the inside of, in red, if you can see it, I know it's not the best uh, <laughs> uh, pixel or quality there, but in red we see mycobacteria. The mycobacteria of tuberculosis or le uh, leprosy, those are anything that's a mycobacteria is really good at resisting being phagist. And this is the uh, multinucleated giant cell here, so um, this would be the remnants of, like, uh, say, macrophages or things like that, and then the epithelial tissue and then the T cells around it, and they form this thick this thick wall thing. So like if you've ever had um, t TB done, if you work in healthcare, you have to have TB testing done periodically. And the first thing they do is they test to see if you've ever been exposed to it, if you have, if you have any type of a response to an antigen from it. And then if you have a response to an antigen from it, they're like, okay, well, he's 
been exposed to it at some point in his life. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's colonizing his uh, lungs. So they'll do a chest x-ray, and usually the chest x-ray will come back fine. But if you do have TB, you'll actually be able to see this huge just wall of all of these granulomas all across this, the patient's chest, right? So for Th2 cells, really their whole function is to orchestrate a synchronized attack against parasites. And usually whenever I say that, I mean like a multicellular parasite. So what are the two ways that we kill multicellular parasites? Well, we usually will flush them out of the body, and that's usually unpleasant for us, uh, or to kill it with inflammation, which is also pretty unpleasant for us. But really involved in the activation of macrophages, IgE antibodies, because remember that's the one that gives us allergies from B cells, activation of the epithelial cells to become, you know, housing more inf and become inflamed, kind of like we saw with the antiphilotoxins there, we're going to have more diapodesis happening there, more uh, leukocyte homing. Um, the smooth muscles are going to start to contract to try to hopefully flush that out of the body. And then we're also going to be recruiting the classic inflammatory response of eosinophils, basophils, mesophils, or mast cells, and then B cells will start to produce that. We've already, this is nothing, nothing new in the context of like the immune system, but it's new in the context of the Th2 cells are actually getting this ball rolling and orchestrating this attack against them. The Th1 cytokines, they specifically interfere on gamma, and then for the Th2 cytokines, specifically interleukin-4, these are the cytokines that also play a role in their effector function, but also have activities in that they induce differentiation to Th1 or Th2 respectively, right? So um, what we can quickly have is this kind of positive feedback loop, if you want to think about it, otherwise known as a polarization event. And, and basically you just have this rapid expansion of either Th1 or Th2 uh, helper T cells that are involved in, in this response, right? And so in this context, I'm talking about leprosy, and leprosy is caused by the mycobacterium leprae. Anytime you hear mycobacterium, I want you to think about something that's highly resistant to phagocytosis by macrophages. So we're thinking, you know, what type of helper T cell is really involved in catalyzing fights against intracellular infections. Um, but anyways, 95% of the people are on, just on planet Earth are actually going to be pretty resistant to infection by it. That's why it has such a long incubation period. It can take up to 20 years in certain contexts. Um, but in patients that have a Th1 you know, type of a bias or polarization response, if you want to think about it. The cytokines that they're producing are going to actually help the infected macrophages suppress their growth by increasing the amount of, you know, oxygen radicals, superoxide, uh, NO, all that stuff that we've, we've talked about when we talked about the macrophage mechanism. Um, and then this is going to suppress the, the actual bacteria's growth and even though we can have chronic inflammation and damage to the skin, everything remains pretty well localized, right? So patients usually aren't going to die from it, and assuming that, you know, they can even get to even third world medical facilities, they'll be a-okay. Um, but if they have, say, for example, a T2, Th2 polarized response, um, large amounts of the pathogen-specific antibodies are going to be made, and they're not going to be very effective against the bacteria, because the bacteria are all hiding inside the macrophages, right? Because remember, Th2 is involved with orchestrating attacks, usually against multicellular parasitic species, right? So here's just kind of a comparison and contrasting of the two different types. So here we see tuberculoid leprosy versus lepromatous leprosy. I don't know, I'm really bad with pronunciation of especially my medical terminology. Um, but this just kind of, you know, you can see the difference between the Th1 and then the Th2 responses between the two. So for the Th1 response, Th1 being good at killing intracellular pathogens, the organisms are present at relatively low levels. There's very low infectivity. The granulomas are going to form. We're going to have local damage, but nothing, you know, systemic or haywire. There's normal serum immunoglobulin levels, uh, normal T cell responsiveness, specific response to Mycobacterium leprae, whereas with Lepromatous leprosy, we have the organisms showing exponential growth inside the macrophages. Apparently, that's what it looks like. These these like cross sections here. I'm going to be brutally honest with the people who made this book. <laughs> I didn't really find that as helpful as I do the actual cartoon diagrams, but I guess I'm really basic like that. Anyways, it has really high infectivity. We have um, disseminated infections, bone tissue, cartilage damage. You know, the, the classical leprosy that you see tends to be from this type of response. So we have hypergammaglobulinemia. We have uh, Th2 coming in, we're activating it, we're trying to produce antibodies to, to stop this infection, but the infection is hiding inside of our macrophages, so there's nothing we can really do. Low or absent T cell responsiveness, uh, and then no response to the actual antigen itself. 
Um, T follicular helper cells are going to be involved in activating B cells that recognize the same antigen as they do. So this is just kind of a picture here saying the T follicular cells are recognized as the peptide derived from the B cell's antigen. The B cell undergoes receptor-mediated phagocytosis with its B cell receptors. In this context, remember the B cell receptors can bind to a whole lot of other things, but they have to go uh, processing and breaking things down, and so they're presenting through their MHC peptide presentation to the T follicular uh, helper T cell, CD4 in this context. Obviously, I don't know why I just said that. Anyway, so this interaction here is going to result in the formation of CD40 interacting with CD40 ligand. And keep in mind, just when we talked about macrophage activation, that's absolutely critical to increase the, in this context, the target cell, B cells, response to the cytokine. And what this ultimately results in is we are going to have go from B cells to having plasma cells and memory cells. <laughs> oh, my handwriting is horrible. And so this interaction ensures that we have um, some self tolerance. Since B cells are constantly being generated in the bone marrow, any ones that are self-reactive that do not receive the T cell help are gonna become anergenic and rapidly die in the secondary lymphoid tissue. That's very, <laughs> uh, B cells are, we're a bit more expendable with them. <laughs> um, the cognitive binding of a B cell and a T cell activates the T cell to release the cytokines, the signal derived by the B cell, delivered to the B cell by the CD40, binding to the CD40 ligand, makes the B cell receptive to the cytokines which drive the clonal expansion. We've seen this before, right, when we talked about macrophages. So here we see um, the B cell binding to, uh, in this context, is a bacterial polysaccharide component. In this context, we're talking about a vaccine conjugate. And usually what's interesting to me is... Uh, we, in the, a good example would be prions. If you've ever seen people who have, I hope you haven't seen people who have been infected with prions, but if you do, um, there's no immune response to that, which I think is interesting because they say that it's, and you're infected with it and partially by improper surgical technique, which I feel like that would result in some type of an immune response, maybe not against the specific prion itself, but I'm getting off, that's off topic. Anyways, so something that has a polysaccharide component to it, right? Um, this conjugate is going to be internalized and then degraded. The peptides from the toxoid are present in the T cell, which activates the B cell, right? We've, it's, we've just talked about that. And the activated B cell differentiates into a plasma cell that produces anti-polysaccharide antibodies to that bacteria, right? So in this context, it's the bacteria's really response, or the uh, B cell's response to the polysaccharide of the bacteria, but it needs that protein to be able to interact with the Th2 because the T cell receptors are all about proteins.